Hey everybody, Brian Zane here, and it's showtime. Showtime to review AEW Revolution, that is. Uh, the big pay-per-view took place this past Sunday in Greensboro, North Carolina, in the same building where Sting really made his name wrestling Ric Flair in that 45-minute draw in 1988, Clash the Champions 1. I reviewed that show, by the way, if you're curious about watching it. It's right there in the Classic Reviews playlist. But uh, yeah, what a great uh, couple of weeks it's been as the industry has collectively shown its love love to Sting on his way out. You know, there's not too many people you see getting that kind of universal praise. Some you don't really, you don't hear people saying too many bad things about, no bad things about with Sting. So it's great to see him going out on his terms on this evening. And in a way, on Sunday night, we were all little Stingers. As a matter of fact, I'm actually wearing this uh, Sting t-shirt uh, under my sweatsuit today to pay homage to the Stinger in this, in this review. So let's get it started. 16 15,000 plus at the Coliseum. It's a sellout. Easily AEW's biggest domestic draw in a long time. They definitely came for Sting as well. Before that, we go to our opening match of the TNT Championship. Christian Cage, accompanied by the Patriarchy, taking on Daniel Garcia. And right from the get-go, Cage is very much doing classic healery sort of work. You know, he is powdering on the outside early on, conferring with his family. He fakes an injury in the rain to get a cheap shot on Garcia and take over. Not to say he doesn't take risks in this thing, because one of the first big moves he does is a big dive to the outside off the top rope. Garcia remaining scrappy. He tries an ankle lock at one point, and now Cage's leg does become a factor, does become a target here. Garcia's dumped to the outside. He avoids a Nick Wayne attack, starts making his comeback. Christian gets his turtleneck pulled up in the corner. Shivani makes a Bazooka Joe reference, which got a huge pop out of me. Oh, I just realized as I said that, bubblegum pop. I'm pretty clever sometimes. Kill switch interferes. The referee's back turn. Not enough to put Daniel away. Daddy Magic comes in and disposes of Kill Switch. There's a beautiful false finish where Christian goes for the spear. His ankle gives out and Garcia hits a pile driver. That one made me bite for sure. Mama Wayne distracts the ref. Nick Wayne pops back up the cheap shot Garcia. We get a kill switch by Cage and the champ retains. I give it three and a half stars out of five. I thought it was a fairly solid opening match. I think that, you know, you're building Garcia up more as this underdog babyface in the wake of the Jericho Appreciation Society. They're showing a lot of, you know, they mention this on commentary, the karma that he is receiving after everything he did in the JAS and now finally breaking out on his own. But he shows a lot of heart in this one. And, you know, when it takes, you know, three to four individuals to beat you, it makes you look pretty strong in the end, even if you do lose. So uh, I'm not saying this is going to be the end for Garcia's push. I'd like to see him get some more chances. But certainly Cage still firing on all cylinders as the TNT champion, in my opinion. I'm curious to see where it eventually goes. Your next match is for the Continental Crown Championship. That triple crown is on the line as Eddie Kingston defends against his old rival in Brian Danielson. I really liked this little change up they did before the matches. Instead of getting the backstage reporter interviewing the wrestler and the wrestler saying some things and then going out, this was very much like sideline reporter aesthetic is what I got here. You went to Lexi Nair talking about Danielson. You went to uh, Renee Paquette talking about Eddie Kingston. And both guys are just in the back background, warming up, not talking, and you've got Lexi and Renee just kind of recounting what they said to them like off air before they were before they were warming up and everything. It's different. It's unique. I don't think I've ever really seen anyone do that in wrestling, that specific kind of delivery, and I think it worked. Anyway, regardless of the ending of the match, the two must shake hands afterward. The match starts out slowly. They're sizing each other up. We go to the strikes and suplexes within minutes, though. Eddie starts to throw the chops, but he hits the ring post by mistake. He suplexed off the apron. Danielson is working the arm and the hand throughout. Lots of grabs, a lot of rolling through and out of holds from both guys. Danielson hitting more big suplexes in this one. One from the top rope goes right back to the arm. Kingston showing some real struggle and pain throughout this match. Kingston finally starts coming back. He hits that back fist, but he immediately regrets it. The triangle choke, Eddie almost fades away. We get dueling chance, the fighting spirit of Eddie as he absorbs the kicks. They trade big suplexes. Eddie staying in the fight. He strikes with his left arm. He hits the powerbomb. Kingston wins and retains. And finally, we got that sportsman.
sportsmanship. We got the handshake at the end of the matchup here, finally showing some respect between these two heated rivals. I give it a four and a half stars out of five. This was just an all out balls to the wall physical war. I loved the storytelling in this matchup. I loved Kingston's, like I said, his selling, I think is what really put it over. The agony he was feeling in that right arm and how he had to, you know, think fast and use his left arm for things. Every time he used the right arm, it affected him. Uh, that was just great work by both guys and something befitting such an epic, you know, rivalry match for this championship. Well, there was originally supposed to be a Meat Madness match on this show, which I imagine was just a multi-man featuring all the biggest guys on the card, but for whatever reason, that match did not happen. They changed it to an eight-man scramble match featuring Wardlow, Brian Cage, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Lance Archer. So those are the Meat guys. You also have Chris Jericho, you've got Dante Martin, you've got Hook, and also Magnus from CMLL. And one thing that this reminded me of is all this Twitter discourse out there right now of like, Who's this person? Oh, I don't understand who this person is. I'm confused and frustrated by it. Like, what is with so many people on social media proudly projecting and declaring their lack of patience and or knowledge or curiosity about professional wrestling? It's one thing not to know people. I certainly don't know who Magnus is going into this show, but at least I was willing to see what he was going to do, and I was going to keep an open mind and just be like, okay, I'll figure it out from watching him. If you do not have the time to Google who somebody is, then just watch a match of theirs and just get an idea and find out for yourself. If you can't do either of those things, then shut the fuck up. Shout out to Jacob the Snake of Roberts who had to fucking hustle to avoid getting hit by Lance Archer's pyro. Early on, we get that meat madness preview. The four biggest guys occupy the ring. They just flex and pose for a minute. We get the meat chance, meat forever, etc. Then their shift apparently ends. We go to the smaller guys who do their own shoulder tackle exchange. Then they each fly out onto the bigger guys. Then all eight guys take turns in different corners of the ring doing this like superplex thing where one guy superplexes, the other guy superplexes. And I hated that spot. It just seems so contrived to me that like all four guys or all four pairings would think to go just the different corners and then they all take turns doing that. And like it was staggered to the point where a lot of guys just had to like kill a lot of time on those corners before they get their spots in. Dante Martin, a couple of times in this match, going for dives and catching his feet on the ropes, looks scary every time. It just gives me flashbacks to when he broke his leg at Super Card of Honor. Double Lion Salt on Lance between Jericho and Magnus. Wardlow throwing guys around for a minute. Hook gets Redrum on Wardlow. Jericho with the walls at the same time. Hobbs goes for a charge on the outside, but Jericho just sprays fog in his face. Well, he is the wizard. He can conjure fire, so why not smoke from the fog machine? In the end, Wardlow hits the powerbomb on Dante Martin to win and get a future title shot. Um, This one I give a star and a half out of five. This match was a lot, you know? It was obviously not what the original plan was. It was meat madness, whatever that was. That was, I can't imagine it would be this much of a clusterfuck because there were so many people involved, a lot of moving parts. They spent too much time like, doing all these stereo spots and setting them up, and that just took me out of it, I think. You know, there's a lot of sitting around and waiting when there's that many people, whether they're on the outside, uh, out of frame, or just getting ready for their spots in the corner or whatever. There were some fun individual moments, but eh, the match didn't really do it for me. In a match for the International Championship, Roderick Strong makes his return to pay-per-view as he challenges Orange Cat for that belt. And I'll tell you what, the star of this show, this match at least, is Roderick's knees, because he is, after all, the Messiah of the Backbreaker, and he's got tons of those in store for this match. One of my favorites, actually, is one of the first ones he ever does, where he picks up Orange by his pockets for a backbreaker. We got a gut wrench backbreaker from the top and right down onto the top turnbuckle. Ugh, that looked brutal. Orange comes back after a while, hits the Panama Sunrise on Strong. We get the beach break, but Roddy grabs the ropes. Strong hitting the end of hard ultimately to win the title. New international champion Matt Taven and Mike Bennett celebrate in the ring. Then Kyle O'Reilly shows up. We've not seen him since last year with that neck injury. He and Strong hug. Mike takes the shirt off his own back and offers it to Kyle, but Kyle gives it back, whispers something to Roderick, then leaves. He looks a little emotional going back up the ramp, the undisputed kingdom looking a little confused. I give it three stars out of five. It's not the best Orange Cassidy or Roderick Strong match I've seen lately, but I think 
both guys definitely uh, did a good job in this one. Uh, Roderick, I think that, like I said, him coming back uh, after being, you know, without wrestling for so long, doing the wheelchair thing, doing the neck brace gimmick, him coming back, it's it's a welcome change to see him back and everything, and I think he will do a uh, great job with the international title. And Orange, of course, did a great job with that belt as well. I'm digging the push of the Undisputed Kingdom right now. You know, they won both their respective matches on this show. And of course, they've been building and been planting the seeds from day one about Wardlow. Like Adam Cole was like, Wardlow's going to win the world title and hand it to me. And Wardlow like makes a face. And like that was something we established at the very beginning. Now that he has this title shot, let's see if they're going to pull the trigger on that or do something with that kind of tension just yet. It's the rematch between John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli taking on FTR. A couple of months ago, these two teams faced off and wrestled a time limit draw. And so this is the rematch. I gotta love the little homage to the Road Warriors that the Blackpool Combat Club had in their entrance. Sting's not the only NWA act getting a tribute in Greensboro tonight. At one point, Dax and Claudio both get up from something and move the same exact way, like they did the same animation in a video game or something. Cash is dumped out of the ring and onto the apron. The Combat Club starts dominating. Dax gets a hot tag, but Cash immediately comes back in and is cut off once again. Dax runs into the ring post and is now bleeding. Doomsday device countered into a power slam. Dax looks gross. It's ironic that Moxley isn't the one bleeding in this match, by the way. Claudio and Moxley hit a doomsday device uppercut combo. Claudio blocks a shatter machine. Get ready for the big swing! Claudio uppercuts Cash mid-flight, hits a neutralizer on the floor. In the ring, Moxley with the death rider on Dax, who kicks out. We get Stereo rear naked chokes on FTR. The referee calls it the Blackpool Combat Club wins. I give it four stars out of five. This was just a really fun physical matchup. You know, it was gritty, it was hard hitting, it was hard fought, and uh, yeah, I think it was just excellent tag team wrestling with a bit of the rough stuff thrown in there. You know, Dax pleading the way he did, and you know, of course, you know, you have fun with the tag count and the tag rules and everything, but that's just AEW for you, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely, I, both teams are fun to watch. I like how FTR can work with just about any team. I like how Moxley and Claudio have been gelling recently just as a tandem. Specifically, it's been good stuff. Not enough time to replace the bloody canvas, so they gotta kill time on commentary. Then we go to the Women's World Championship match as timeless Tony Storm defends against her old friend, Deanna Parazzo. I've really enjoyed this angle so far. I know that timeless Tony is a very polarizing gimmick. I know that when I put that on the thumbnail of my best of 2023 video, I was gonna get some backlash. I did, but be that as it may, I'm digging the gimmick, and I like the story they were telling here with her and Deanna Parazzo, the history they had, the fact they had matching tattoos from an earlier time when they worked that into the storyline, commitment to the bit by Tony for her to, you know, cover, not cover up, but to modify the tattoo and putting the dagger through it and everything. The symbolism is great. I think this has been very good build between these two former friends. We get a fake out for a minute as we get the old Tony Storm entrance, but it's Mariah May in disguise. Well, she literally brought that Tony Storm that Deanna wanted. At one point in the match, Tony taking Deanna to VKC takes her down by the hair to get on the offensive. They actually coined the term Lady Yambags for that moment. Wasn't it the name of the book that Stephanie McMahon was going to write and then it never came to be? Deanna and Tony slap each other for a bit. Perazzo goes on a run, but Tony with the trip, then the hip. Tony falls off the apron into the waiting arms of Luther, then Deanna with a diving attack onto them both. Tony's tapping out as Luther distracts the referee. Mariah May causes another distraction, allowing Tony to hit the pile driver to win and retain. I give it two and a half stars out of five. I thought the match was okay. The finish a bit too samey to what we saw in the opener for the TNT Championship. And also I thought was kind of flat and cliche given the emotional hook we were supposed to be feeling uh, in this particular matchup and the rivalry they have. I'm still loving the Tony Storm gimmick at the moment. I just worry about what we're getting here with this reign. Are we gonna get another Britt Baker situation where, you know, these new people come up and challenge Tony, she bats them down, and then they're just kind of like rudderless for a while. I wanna see a rematch of these two. I want, I'd, I'd like to see more progression in this story leading to another title match at the very least before Perazzo moves on to something else. It's a Don Callis family joint as Will Ospreay takes on Kanosuke Takeshita in singles action. This is Ospreay's first pay-per-view match with AEW as an exclusive member of the AEW roster. No more New Japan ties for he. This is a fantastic matchup. If you liked Osprey versus Omega at Forbidden Door 
last year, I think you'll get a real kick out of this one because these guys are just moving at another level. They move with such high velocity and such high impact in everything they do. Every moment here, there's something fast or hard hitting going on here. Hitting quickly and with purpose. Osprey hitting a springboard forearm, follows up with a handspring kick and a big slingshot dive. Takesh it up with a very pretty plancha later to the outside. Both men are laying into each other with some skull rattling forearms. The hidden blade is intercepted. Osprey barely gets that shoulder up. Takesh it up with a brain buster on the top turnbuckle. Oof, that looked brutal creates a huge bruise on Osprey's back. Takeshita puts the knee pad down. A great exchange on commentary here. This is going to be bone on bone if he connects with this. This is going to be over if he connects with yeah, this. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yes. What? Osprey survives getting dropped on his head twice. We get more fighting. The Tiger Driver 91, the Hidden Blade, the win for Osprey. What a match. Kyle Fletcher, he's the ROH TV champion. He's a family member, Osprey's good friend. They're announcing on air that the two of them are going to face off in a singles match at Dynamite this Wednesday. But literally, as Excalibur is saying that, the two of them are hugging it out in the ring. What a weird roller coaster of emotions that just was. I give it four and a half stars out of five. I really enjoyed this matchup. I think that Osprey and Takeshita, it's the best you're gonna see from either of those guys because I think they have such great complementary styles. And like I said, if you liked Osprey versus Omega, there were some definite shades of that in this matchup. I'm excited to see what Osprey can do in AEW now that he's gonna be fully there. Uh, I wonder how long he'll be facing just members of his own stable before he eventually finds some juicier competition. In the semi-main for the AEW World Championship, Samoa Joe defends against Swerve Strickland and Hangman Page. The latter two names of that lineup, they've executed a good old-fashioned double turn and it's actually worked really well. I'm liking, you know, Hangman's descent into madness as he's been just kind of obsessed with, you know, getting rid of Swerve and trying to eliminate his chances at winning the world championship, almost at the expense of him winning a championship. He would just rather Swerve not be the champ than, you know, him be the champ at this point. And it's, I think his character progression is really good. I think it's super justified. Justified heels, I think, are some of, like, the best and most compelling because he's got a legitimate gripe for what Swerve did to him and his family. And Swerve, you know, uh, philosophically hasn't changed all that much, but he is getting more more beloved by the crowd. He's definitely more of an anti-hero. He is saying a couple more face-like things at this point, and the fans want to cheer him. You know, even though he was a psychopath earlier like last year and everything, they still love Swerve. And uh, Hangman is doing things that is making him not that, you know, conquering hero that he was a couple of years ago, fighting Kenny Omega, for instance. And I think seeing the evolution of both those characters right now in the realm of this world title program is really fun to watch. Also, Jim Jim Ross back on commentary for the first time in a while. He's been having some medical issues. Good to see him back at it. Joe immediately reminds the other two that he is there. He starts baiting them both up. He nopes Swerve. He did the thing. Joe fighting off a pair of powerbomb attempts out of the corner. Dude, just get down from there. Ah, too late. Both guys get him. Page and Swerve staying very much in conflict here. These guys, that's the big story of this match like I was kind of alluding to. Every time you see these guys fight, it looks that much more like urgent and like, oh my god, the match really could end. Joe multiple times in this matchup has to break up pinfalls between the two of them. We get a muscle buster to Hangman, but Swerve stops Joe. A house call to Joe's mush, one to Page. We get a kick out. The Swerve stomp to Joe. Swerve's got it won, but Page pulling the referee out of the ring. Hangman grabs the belt and Dex Swerve with it twice. Hits two buck shots. A new referee slides in. We get a two count. Goes for a third buck shot, but we get the clutch. Swerve dives onto both of them. Swerve rejecting Prince Nana's crown, but it almost costs him. He rolls up Joe. Hangman just beating the shit out of referee number two now. Another buck shot. Swerve hits one. The JML driver, but Joe dumps him. Puts the clutch on Hangman. Page taps out as Swerve is crawling to them. Four out of five stars for me. I loved this match. I loved the finish. A great story at the end. Uh, you know, I, the throughout the whole match was great, but the ending was also pretty choice. They, they dropped this key bit of storytelling there in commentary. Did Paige tap out because he knew he had it lost, or did he tap out to really stick it to Swerve a little more? I'm not entirely sure that theory or kind of doing that 
holds up because like I think it would have been a stronger moment if Paige and Swerve were facing each other when that spot happened. I, I recall that you know Paige was looking away from that and might not have been able to see Swerve crawl to them. I think if they did that a little bit differently, it would have been a bit more powerful. But either way, still a great match. And yeah, continuing that angle of Swerve and uh, Paige hating each other. I think it, this storyline, this feud, not done between the two of them. And uh, as far as Swerve goes, you know, you want to see him get Hangman off his back. You want to see him beat Joe and become the champion. And I think the fans are definitely on board for that. My only question is, where does Wardlow fit into all this? It's time now for the main event, a tornado match for the AEW Tag Team Championships as Sting and Darby Allin defend against Matthew and Nicholas Jackson, the EVPs, the Young Bucks. This is Sting's final match. And you know what? I'm just going to reiterate this to everyone who is complaining about it. This was Sting's choice. Sting wanted this match. This was the match Sting wanted. All of Sting's friends are here for the show tonight. You've got Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat, Magnum TA, Nikita Koloff checking his phone, Scotty Riggs, they're all here. Matthew and Nicholas get the Cody Vader. I guess no one else is using it these days. There's a great video package they play between Darby and Sting's entrances. The final show time is Sting sitting alone in this empty theater while all these highlights and moments from his career flash before his eyes. There's New Japan, WCW, is represented there. There's, of course, AEW. I'm getting the feels, man, based on how they're doing this. So we've got the entrance. Sting's AEW music plays, and we see Sting's two sons coming out dressed as, you know, Great American Bash 91 Sting and as Wolfpack Sting. Although I gotta admit, that moment does feel a bit diminished when we had something earlier in the show where somebody comes out dressed as a past version of another wrestler. But then, Seek and Destroy by Metallica plays, and the Stinger comes out. What a cool moment that was. And again, I'm definitely feeling some feelings as this intro is happening. The faces start off hot. Sting's sons also do Stinger splashes. One of them gets a lot of airtime on his. Double Scorpion Deathlock in the first minute or so. The fighting continues on the outside while Sting's sons continue to set stuff up. I'm like, are they going to leave at some point or are they going to be involved in the match too? Then Sting gets out panes of glass. This is not going to end well. He starts swinging his bat at the Bucks who flee. They go into the crowd, we see a couple of swerve dancers hanging out in the wings. Darby takes a falcon arrow through tables on one end of the stage. Sting takes a suplex through tables on another end. Darby is on his own for a minute, fighting the bucks in the ring. Darby with a swanton off the Jeff Hardy tribute ladder to the outside, falling through a giant pane of glass on the chairs. My god, what a brutal sacrifice he made there. And those cuts looked gnarly. Sting is back. He gets powerbombed through a table in the ring. He stings up, but is thrown through another pane of glass. We we had Dick Kick City and the Scorpion Death Drop by Matthew in a kick out. Nicholas grabs a title belt, but Ricky Steamboat stops him. He fights back. Matthew hits him with a chair. Nature Boy Ric Flair slowly rolls into the ring to check on Sting. He puts himself between Sting and the Bucks. He gets double super kicked. We get one to Steamboat. We get the belt to Sting and a kick out. A funny moment where they go, we're not sorry. We hate you. We get the double kick. Sting pops up again. We get the EVP trigger and a kick out. Another one, a kick out at one. They're setting up for the TK driver. Darby comes back, throwing Nicholas through a table. We get the death drop to Matthew, a coffin drop, Scorpion death lock. Matthew taps, Sting and Darby win. They win and retain the titles in Sting's last match. What an incredible moment that was. Sting gets some time on the microphone after the match to say thank you to everybody. He talks about the memories of wrestling flair in that building in 88. And as he's starting to get good, all of a sudden Darby whispers in his air and tells me, you gotta go home because they're gonna go off the air. And Sting's last words on pay-per-view broadcast are something to the effect of, oh, they're giving me cues. Haha, <laughs> fade to black. That's the end of Sting's career. But like, you know, I'm sure the crowd in Greensboro heard a much more, you know, inspiring uh, emotional speech after the show went off air. But that's still, you know, what a, what a WCW moment that was. Folks, we're out of time. We got to fade to black. It's very appropriate given who they're honoring here. But that was still a great match. Four stars out of five for me. It's a hell of a match. Some absolutely ridiculous stuff from everyone involved. Anytime Sting would do these stunts that we've seen him do in AEW, I'm always blown away. I'll tell you what, I was shocked that they won the match too, if I'm being honest, because I was totally just certain on the fact that, you know, 
stings, as old school as he comes. He's going to go out, you know, on his back like a true old school wrestler would. But no, he won. He got the tap out, and I think that was honestly the right call. It was definitely like a feel good moment that this show needed to kind of cap off and just wrap everything up in a bow. And it would have been a sad ending if Sting ends up losing, has cut that speech. But for him to win and go out on top, I mean, I think that's such a great thing for Sting when you consider how many times, like in WCW, for instance, he was kind of passed over by, uh, by his peers to do other things. Like him getting that spotlight, him being the center of attention and getting all this love and getting all this respect, I think is absolutely uh, so, uh, it's overdue. And it's just wonderful to see Sting getting all this love. And I think that, you know, AEW, you can knock them for a lot of things over the years, but one thing that they have done right above everything else in my opinion, is how they have booked Sting, how they've treated him as a legend, how they've used him in the ring. And it's not just them like bringing this old broken man out to do these things. He is delivering as well. Sting was able to perform perfectly well in those capacities. And I think that combination of the booking being strong enough and him carrying his end of the bargain just made for a fantastic run. It is like, that is one of the perfect all time like legend runs I think you're ever gonna see in wrestling. And AEW absolutely did that one right. But now that it's all over, can we agree that the young Bucks were perfectly fine opponents for Sting in his final match. I could not believe, well, I could, but I could not believe the outrage that was going on online when it was announced that the Bucks were going to be Sting's opponents uh, at Revolution. Because can anyone give me like a clear, level headed explanation as to why that would have been a bad match other than people just going back to their, you know, preconceived notions and their their perceptions about the Young Bucks. The, those kind of perceptions, by the way, that they are absolutely 1 million percent leaning into with their new EVP characters, just owning it and taking that perception and kind of like throwing it back in the fans' faces. Like, yeah, I can't really think of any other people, like maybe FTR in terms of people who are like, okay, it's gotta be a tag match. You can't put Sting in a singles match right now at his age, so that option's out. So who are you gonna get for tag teams? Maybe FTR. That was probably the other good idea. But I mean, you're going to have that instant heat with the Bucks in those gimmicks and Sting being the babyface in Greensboro kind of writes itself. But I think, yeah, the Young Bucks, they can have that good match. They, they work well with Darby. They worked well incorporating Sting into everything, having it all make sense. And yeah, it was a really good match. Why were we complaining going in? But be that as it may, and in all seriousness, congratulations to Sting. What a hell of a way to go out on a phenomenal multi-decade career. It's something that so few in the business have come even close to replicating. All the things that he had done, all the things he'd accomplished, all the things he had put up with, you know, for good and for bad. He has had an amazing career. If there's one person who I think is gonna really honor their last match and their retirement, I think it's gonna be Sting. I'd be very surprised if he reneged on that retirement there, but uh, you really can't ask for much of a better send-off. There's very few, I think, that would kind of be up there, in my opinion. Uh, I don't even consider myself, like, I wasn't a huge Sting fan growing up. He was not in my top ten, and, like, I'd always admired him, always kind of appreciated him, uh, but this is where I really started to feel, you know? Even during in this kind of send-off, like the, the, the curtain calls he would have in the weeks leading up to this, coming down from the rafters on Dynamite last week, um, and then this match up here. It was definitely making me feel a bit verklempt. And, you know, uh, if, if you can feel something in wrestling, then that's all there is to it. I think that's the most important thing of all. And Sting definitely made generations of fans feel something. And that is beautiful. Oh, and by the way, just getting this out there, Sting better than The Undertaker. Sorry. My grade for Revolution 2024 is an A minus. I thought this was just a good ass show. It was not perfect, perfect. There were a couple of weak spots for me, like the scramble match, and then I think the finish to the women's championship match. Again, a bit too identical to the finish of another title match earlier in the show. But I mean, you got a lot of really exciting and entertaining matches, and each match gave you something a little bit different. And I think that's part of what makes AEW uh, so fun to watch a lot of times. You know, the last pay per view they did. World's End, it was not a good pay-per-view. And I think that it went kind of flew in, uh, against their normal trend of having like really good pay-per-views, even if their TV is kind of lacking. And this one, right back on that trend, I think AEW delivered another solid pay-per-view. It is far more than a one-match show. It's not just Sting's last match. It's the, it's the world title match. It's the Continental Crown match, you know? There's so many other just good matches on this show. It's, it's Osprey and Takeshita. This, I think, this show overall, I think, shows you a lot of the 
the best of what AEW can do when they're really trying to fire on all cylinders. But what did you think of Revolution, folks? I want to hear about it in the comment section below. Hey, if you got any Sting memories you want to share, I want to see those as well. And speaking of which, there is a brand new playlist on my channel called Thank You Sting. It is a collection of some of the most Sting-centric videos I have done on this channel, both the good and the bad, not just kind of like long forms, but also some of the classic reviews where he's played a pivotal role on those shows as well. So do check that out if you want to get more of a sting fix here on the channel. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, hit that bell icon for all the notifications. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Ow!